Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Tristan Virtual Studios for our fifth episode of In Conversation with me, Rick Lewis, Tristan Capital, and our friends. We've got another busy show today, but before we get started, let's look back at where we were the last time we caught up. In the second quarter of 2022, we saw signs of pickup in the European real estate market as we moved through the cycle reset. This pickup was unfortunately short-lived as the Russian and Ukraine conflict created additional market instability and drove up the inflation rate, which was already elevated due to soaring energy and commodity prices. All of this ultimately led to a rapid pivot and unwinding of central bank monetary policy. Historically low interest rates, which would never be the norm, were steadily and rapidly raised, which increased local and global cost of capital and sent global capital markets further into stasis. Later in 2022, we saw the first signs of liquidity crunch as the global banking sector faced its first major stress test since the GFC. More recently, negativity in the real estate sector and worry about price correction and capital market contraction have dominated the headlines, capped off by the European and global market worry that office tenants would eschew current holdings for much smaller footprints. Although important to highlight here that not all offices are made equal. More on this a little bit later. So you could be forgiven for believing the headlines and accepting fate, but that's not exactly how we see the world. Despite these challenges, we raised our largest fund to date, our sixth value-added fund through a piece of six. We closed our first debt fund, invested it, and started raising capital for the next one, TIPS2, providing us with a healthy amount of dry powder in both the debt and equity space so that we're now poised to hit the ground running when markets reopen, as we know they will. We know that debt capital markets offer a big opportunity. There's around $1.4 trillion of maturing debt in the US market over the next five years, and around 150 billion euros of similarly maturing debt in Europe, and only around 15 to 20 billion euros of dry powder to address this refinancing need. This shortage of fairly priced risk tolerant debt capital has been magnified post COVID as banks increasingly focused on a narrow tier of core lending leaving big gaps in the real estate debt capital markets. There's a window of opportunity right now for private debt, where we're now securing equity returns while assuming debt level risk because of structural changes in the banking sector. But we need you, our clients and others to understand the opportunity and see the magnitude and value of this near to medium term opportunity as it expands. At a time when the O word office has become somewhat of an expletive in the CIO suite and is unfairly representative of all real estate, We need to work more creatively to help you see what we see, what real estate still has to offer, and the size and depth of the coming opportunity that will arise after these tough times abate. Our portfolios are showing us again and again that while capital markets are challenged, European real estate fundamentals are strong. Rents are up, vacancies down, and for those managers with the best space, strong ESG credentials, good amenities, and location the occupier appetite is still robust and getting stronger. A resident macro meteorologist, Simon Martin, will share our thoughts on that and his take on that shortly in his high-speed, crunch time, two-minute overview segment of facts, conjecture, and insight. Last time we met, I updated you on several initiatives under the ESG banner, and we continue to make great strides both at corporate fund and asset level. As well as focusing our efforts on our own business and operations, We continue to lay the groundwork to build a more diverse pipeline of talent, not only at Tristan, but more broadly in the real estate and real estate private equity industry. Together with Goldman Sachs, Eastill Secured, and SEO London, we spearheaded and funded an initiative to introduce undergraduates from under-resourced and underrepresented groups in the UK to careers in real estate and real estate private equity. This builds on the work that the U.S. chapter of SEO has been involved in for some time in its partnership with the PRIA Foundation, which we are also a proud sponsor. The real estate program is now in its third year and we're just about to kick off the next intake of undergraduate students who can use the program to create a pathway to unlock opportunities in our industry. 425 students have completed the program and the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. Not only does the program offer practical learning across the spectrum of the industry, arguably more importantly, it provides a network that might have otherwise been unachievable for many of these students. 
We're working hard to walk the talk, but there's a lot more work to do when it comes to equality and opportunity. Now, before I introduce you to our VIP guest today, let's check in with Simon Martin, who will be bringing us this episode's edition of FCI. Simon, what have you got for us today? Thanks, Rick. Mixed messages continue to be sent to the CRE sector by the capital markets and the real economy. And the net effect is that investors are sitting on their hands and volumes remain extremely low. That said, despite the fear of a dramatic CRE crash landing and a GFC style recap roller coaster, the valuation cycle has been rather benign. There's no sense of panic and people are working collaboratively to resolve their problems. The key to this calm approach stems from the operating fundamentals, which in Europe for the most part remain relatively stable. The resilience of the economy is clearly important here, but ultimately this relatively soft landing is largely a function of supply constraint. Vacancy rates for grade A property are still sub 5%, and in many cases there's little or no grade A space being built. Now in prior vacancy cycles, rates like these would have been the cue for investors to get back to work and start allocating capital, but they're clearly hanging back. So what's going on? Well, we think there are two things going on in practice, two constraints limiting investors' willingness to commit. The first is the psychodrama playing out in the US office market. This is a situation you can't sugarcoat. The US office market has over 850 million square meters of space sitting empty across its major metros. To put that number in context, that's almost three times the total stock of the London office market. That's epic. We can't emphasize this enough though. This is very much a US problem. Europe has nothing like this scale of overhang. We count the inventory of empty space in the major European office markets at about 24 million square meters, which is 2.8% of the US number. I'll say it again, 24 million versus 850 million. Nevertheless, when the US is in pain, the spillover effect into the global CRE market is significant. Even if it's totally unjustified, Europe's caught up in the fug. The second effect that we're thinking about is the volatility of rates and the uncertainty around the cost of capital. Central banks have been trying their best to signal normal times ahead, but in practice, there's little anyone can do to reassure people without a clear cut recession. Yep, I'm afraid only time in a recession will deliver a clear sense of normal service when it comes to rates. This means that we have to continue to be patient. So what should we conclude? Well, we think we're getting closer to a turning point. In our Q2 numbers, the preferred measure of fair value that we use in the sector has shifted to be bang in time with its long run average. Even if we get a clear recession and rates dip 100 basis points, the maths say that we'd be slightly into cheap territory, which isn't bad. Now, it's not 2013 throw money at it cheap, but it's cheap enough to make people pick up the pen and I'd rather have it a little bit cheap and 5% bacon and calm than GFC cheap, empty and utterly chaotic. Yep, Rick, I have to say it. In my fairy tale world, two years of Goldilocks is infinitely preferable to five years of Angry Bears. Roll on 2024. Thanks, Simon. Well, that brings me to today's VIP guest. This person has a two decade strong and varied career in consulting, education, and the third sector. She's a trustee of Virgin Unite, the charitable foundation of the Virgin brand and the Branson family, and is also the founder of Educate UK, a social enterprise which helps schools to improve the mental health and well being of their students. Her mission is to ensure that those from underrepresented and under resourced families have had the opportunity to access great opportunities, but also to build the required skills to navigate change. Please join me in giving a warm Tristan Virtual Studios welcome to today's guest, Natalie Richards, Chief Executive of SEO London. Hi Natalie, and thank you for joining us on our infamous and famous show. As you may know, um, we like to multi-process. So today we've got a game that we're gonna play while we have our conversation. <laughs> this is Kerplunk. Don't know if you're familiar with it, but you will become familiar with it, I hope. Um, Last time, Eric Collins from Impact X was here, and uh, I think we played Monopoly. He wasn't very good at it. I'm, nah, he wasn't very good at all. But uh, I'm sure you're going to be great at this. I'm going to ask you a few questions and, uh, and start the game. And I'm going to start with the Tristan Blue pull, and voila. There we go. Nice. So as done. You, yeah, thank you. So <laughs> as you think about this, um, we've been working together for a while now uh, as part of our involvement with SEO London. And can you tell us a little bit about your path to SEO London? How did you get started and, and how did you become involved? 
Absolutely, and thank you so much for the invite. I'm delighted to be here, and it's uh, quite a treat to be able to play Kaplunk at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah, so um, my path, I guess, to SEO London is quite a long one because when I was going through university and I studied at the University of Leicester and then also studied in France as well, um, I went through a program that was very similar to um, what SEO London does, and it completely changed my life. I grew up um, not too far from where we are now in the east end of, of London, a uh, relatively humble beginning. Um, didn't know about careers in consulting or investment banking or many of the career paths that I would later go into and it was a program that really opened my eyes to all of the opportunities out there um, and helped to prepare me for career success. I then spent um, just over a decade in consulting, I got my MBA from INSEAD, finished up at Apple in the e-commerce team, um, opening international Apple online stores across EMEA. Uh, so I very much had a corporate background. Uh, but in my spare time was doing a lot of mentoring, a lot of giving back, acutely aware that as a black woman coming from the background that I did, I could be um, inspiring and supportive to others. So that rippled through my career and I decided I wanted to do more of that type of work. So I set up a social enterprise uh, called Educate that I ran for just under 10 years. Um, and I grew it quite significantly and was at a point where I was thinking, what's next for me? And I wanted to combine my dual passions of being in the corporate space and running um, a social enterprise. And I found this wonderful offer um, to work at um, SEO London, where I bring together those passions of working with the corporate space, but also making huge differences to the lives of young people um, with massive amounts of talent, but who need opportunity. So here I am. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm far be it from me to sort of ever wander into the conversation about age, but it sounds like you've had two lifetimes of achievements <laughs> in that time. So uh, I'm impressed. Um, thank you for that. Um, feel free to, to try your luck at Kerplunk. We're just about to kick off our third year of the program, and uh, can you talk to us about how it's going and what are your aspirations for the program going forward? Well, in, yes, in summary, um, the real estate program is, uh, is a program that, that we are hugely proud of. Um, so understanding that within the real estate sector, and it's not dissimilar from many other elements of finance, well done. <laughs> um, there is a distinct lack of diversity and we tend to see diversity from three different lenses. So first of all, those students from ethnically diverse backgrounds. Um, we also understand there's a massive underrepresentation of women. So we focus on gender balance um, and also those young people from um, under, sorry, low income backgrounds. Yeah. Um, so um, we, we have those three lenses and the programs that we construct really help those young people who typically wouldn't have access to these types of careers to be able to achieve success. Um, and we've been running this, um, this, we're going into our third year now. Year one, um, we had 125 students, of which um, four got internships. Um, and this year, we've done incredibly well. So 300 students, so we increased the cohort size, but already over 40 have internships. So you can see just the scale of progress in a short period of time, and we have even bigger ambitions for, for the next year. Yeah. Well, can I, can I dive into that a little bit deeper and, and ask you to state the obvious, why are programs like this so important to the, the community that we're helping here? Absolutely. So the real estate sector and the finance sector more broadly are, are known to be incredibly undiverse. So it's very difficult for people from low income backgrounds um, and, and, and those from ethnically diverse backgrounds to be able to not only understand that there are these fantastic opportunities yeah. out there for yeah. them, but to know how they might be able to get into, um, into these particular careers. And even if they do have an understanding, they're often thinking, will they want me? And yeah. will I have the networks and the connections to get there? To build the confidence and the networks to be, to, to enter it, be successful in it, conversant in it and, and, and move forward. That's right. absolutely it, yes. So much of it is about us supporting them with the mindset, the self-belief, but also giving our candidates the tools, the practical tools, so they can ace a case study or an interview or a mock assessment center. And some of the young people that we support come from such different backgrounds that they just would not be able to see a pathway to success without our support. So that's why the, our types of programs are so incredibly important. Yeah, and even though we're conversant and we live in it, you know, every day, so many different ways with the work that we do and even our lived experience, you know, can we just talk for a moment about sort of what you think and what we think the biggest challenges are on the pathway to sort of bigger and better aspiration, right? Like when you really step back, what are those things that are just in the way that keep 
high-performing, well-meaning, well-intent young people with grit from getting to the place that is their full self-actualization. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a range of, of different challenges, and particularly as we find ourselves in the midst of the cost of living crisis, some of yeah. those are even more acute. But what we often see is that some of our candidates have what we call the um, imposter syndrome. They just don't feel like they would belong in certain settings or would understand how to navigate those settings. And so we spend a lot of time really focusing on soft skills development, giving them that self-belief, um, and helping them to understand that um, they have so much to offer these these partners, our partner firms, and, and these sectors more broadly. Um, so yeah, we spend a lot of time, you know, focusing on you know trying to get rid of imposter syndrome, confidence, um, and them developing the tools that they need to, to succeed. And, and I see it was my part of my lived experience, but I see it all the time with the people I work with. Just humanizing and normalizing the people in the situations. They get in and they realize like oh, this is a person with the same kind of insecurities or bad dressing or bad sense of humor that I have or, or vice versa. And they go, I can do this. That person's not very different than me. They just happen to be older or more included or slightly more successful than I am right now. And they go, well, I'm on the pathway. But getting that first moment where you start to go, oh, this person is not much different from me. Right. No, you're absolutely right. And so we create opportunities on our programs for our candidates to be stepping outside of their comfort zone. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. When they do, they learn that actually I can think on my feet. I can, uh, you know, I belong here just as much as anybody else and I have a huge amount to offer. So yeah, yeah that's, a, that's part of the process. Yeah, fantastic. Well, this is a fun part of the show where we're going to offer